This is our second um, in the series. We did some propagation by seed last month. We'll be talking about air layering today. And then we're gonna have these second Saturday monthly series up for um, all of 2021 also. So as we work through the propagation series, through February, then we'll kind of switch over in early spring and start to talk about some of our project specifics and even get into details of outplanting. Um, so progressively moving on as we go. Um, okay, so quick introductions. My name is Kristen Kane. I am the project director for Huyoko Alao Poco. Our organization, if you're not familiar, is a Kailua Windward Oahu based organization. We've been around since, well, as a nonprofit since 2007, but much earlier than that as just a, a hui of community organizations. Um, but our projects focus around water quality um, and ecosystem restoration. So a lot of our work is in the urban areas of Ko'olau Poco, focusing on repairing restoration or controlling stormwater runoff so that ultimately the water getting into our waterways is healthier. And ultimately we've got healthier streams and healthier ocean ecosystems. Um, so we also have today with us Jenna Masters. Jenna is one of our awesome board members and she is a natural area reserve specialist for the Division of Forestry and Wildlife. She was born and raised in Kailua also. So super happy to have her on board with us and she's been a big champion of pushing these Zoom series along and, and getting those all situated for us and videoed and all the pre-recorded stuff is thanks to Jenna. So that is intro to Jenna. And then today we also have our special guest propagator is Miss Brittany Lawton. She got her BA from Hawaii Pacific University in environmental science with a minor in biology. And she is currently the plant propagator for the University of Hawaii Campus Arboretum. Uh, before working there, she worked uh, for four years as a field tech with Oahu's Army Natural Resource Program, who Jenna and I have also worked for. <laughs> And then she spent another two and a half years working as um, a plant propagation technician for the Army's Natural Resource Program as well. So we've all, I guess we're, we were all at OANRP in some point, at, but all at different times. So that was cool to, to touch base and, and get to know each other's time there as well. So I am going to kind of run back of the house and I am going to pass on intros and let the series start with Jenna and Brittany. Yeah, I guess I'll unmute myself first. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Brittany. Um, the first video is just going to be a little bit of an introduction to the Campus Arboretum. And so you will see Naveo, uh, who is one of Brittany's supervisors, right? And so she's just going to tell us a little bit about the campus. And then if we have any questions afterwards, we'll field it. So that's kind of how we're going to run it. We're going to do a pre-recorded video, and then we'll have space in between for questions and live questions. So um, without further ado, let me share a screen and see if I can get this together here. I am Novell Kai with the Campus Arboretum at the University of Hawaii Mano. We're in the greenhouse now to showcase some of the lovely plants that we have propagated by our talented, amazing propagator, Brittany Lawton. But before we get to her, <laughs> I want to share a little bit of background of the campus as an arboretum. An arboretum is a botanical garden that focuses on a tree collection. And we, the campus contains about 4,000 trees among about 6,000 plants. Um, we only have about a thousand different types, uh, different species, so we have a lot of, we have a lot of repeat trees, as you notice if you drive in or around the campus. 
The campus interior roads are lined with shower trees and the exterior perimeter is marked by monkey pot trees. Our Arboretum accreditation comes through the Morton Arbnet Arboretum program. And so there are four levels within that program and we are at level uno. Uh, since the campus moved from temporary from its temporary location in Honolulu near Thomas Square in 1912, uh, the Board of Regents asked the then botanist and naturalist for the university, Joseph Rock, to beautify what was then the wildlands of campus, which was formerly used as pig farms and it was mainly Kiave groves, dry barren. Uh, they asked him to beautify these, the campus. And as a botanist and naturalist, one was excited to do so. And he fulfilled that request with gusto, began planting in 1912, created the first plant map in 1920. That map contained about 600 different plants with points um, and a record of where he got them from. Some of those plants still exist in the grounds. Some of them have been moved to other locations, um, but we like to consider that point, 1920, as the beginning of the campus as an arboretum. It's the beginning of the botanical collection that is documented for the plants on campus. However, it wasn't until 2016 that the campus gained its official Arboretum accreditation, uh, meeting level one requirements for the ArbNet Arboretum program. Lion Arboretum, the university's other Arboretum, <laughs> is at level four because of the much research and seed lab program that they have. Hey, I forgot to mention that of the 1,000 different taxa, only about 10% of them are native. Don't worry. One of our objectives is to increase the number and diversity of native plant presence on campus. That's where Brittany comes in. Thanks, Brittany. <laughs>
So the first thing would be sphagnum moss. You can find this at any, I would say like city mill or Home Depot kind of thing. What you're looking for is something that's more of the moss material and less of like sticks and twigs. Um, this is going to retain moisture in your air layer and encourage root development there. You're going to need water to hydrate that moss. A nice pair of sharp pruners, scissors, anything you've got. Um, and then plastic. Um, you can easily use like a gallon size Ziploc bag. You want something that's thicker and kind of sturdy but still gives a little bit of stretch. Um, I've also used kind of like that plastic drop cloth material for painting. Um, that's something that you can find at like an Ace Hardware or any home improvement store. Secondly, or thirdly or whatever, you'll want Clonex. Gel is really easy to apply to your air layer. Um, you can find this at most hydroponic or aquaponic stores. You can also find it online on Amazon. Um, if that's not available to you, there are also a lot of like powder hormones that you could use that you can find at like a Walmart, a Long's, and a Home Depot. You also want like a secondary container um, to put your hormone in. You don't want to dip directly into your main bottle. That can cause contamination and ruin the entire product potentially. Then you'll want flagging. So typically we use flagging tape. This is something that you can find at like an Ace Hardware Safety Systems. Um, if you can't find this, you could easily use like electrical tape. And I've also seen other people use like wire. And that's just gonna hold your air layer to the tree and keep it tight. Then you want like a nice sharp knife. Ideally something with the blade only on one side. Sometimes you find knives with blades on both sides, but you want a flat, safe edge to kind of apply pressure as you're doing your air layer. Um, then you want a Sharpie. This would be good for labeling the date as to when you installed it. And a good practice is to always disinfect your tools with isopropyl alcohol. Um, a lot of species of plants, particularly those of citrus, are pretty susceptible to fungal pathogens. And it's just a good common practice to keep your plants um, safe with any pests and disease. And lastly, depending on where you're doing your air layer, the climate that you're doing it in, um, sometimes foil is really nice to help reflect that heat and prevent your air layer from overheating and causing rot. So these are kind of the basic things that you need well, to do a lot of water. Stand up. Can you see? Wow, that's a lot of Look at that. Whoa. Whoa. Sorry, we don't have anything ducks. I think there's some baby ducks too. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. Cool. I love having the reminder of all the gear. That's great to show everything out, um, like nice and laid out, how it's all got to be, and a great reminder to have everything sanitized as well, especially with um, everything we've got going on these days. Sanitize everything, even your tools. Not seeing any questions, not seeing any questions yet. So if you guys do have questions, feel free to either just throw them in the chat throughout um, the event or um, in between the videos, you can come off mute and ask. Awesome. Yeah, so if we don't have any questions, we'll roll um, into the next segment, which is really getting into making that cut. So here we go. Give me two seconds. <laughs> okay. Let me put myself on mute. Sorry, guys. Here we have the hibiscus bracket rigii. It is our state flower. It's also an endangered species. Um, it's endangered because of fire threat and habitat loss. Um, so today we're going to actually be air layering this particular plant. So we're going to go over what you're looking for when you're air layering something. Um, typically hibiscus, for example, is really easy to do from vegetative cuttings, um, but you can also do it with air layers. The benefits of doing air layers are that some species just don't take well from vegetative cuttings. Um, the downside of air layering is that it's a bit more labor intensive 
and it takes more time to get one particular rooted plant compared to doing hundreds of cuttings. You're just sticking in a hormone, waiting for it to root, and then you can pot it up. But for today, we'll do an air layer on the hibiscus. So basically what you're looking for, for a species or a specimen to air layer, first off, you want something that's a healthy plant. Looking at this plant, I would say it's pretty healthy. You got a lot of new growth at the top. It's nice and green, actively growing, and it doesn't have any flowers or fruit. It's important not to have any kind of reproductive um, specimens on this plant because the energy will be going towards making fruit and flowers rather than putting roots into your air layer. Secondly, you don't want anything obstructing. So you don't want a lot of bushes in the way because it's just going to make it harder to do your air layer and be pretty frustrating in the end. You also want it at a good height. You don't want to be doing an air layer that's two feet above you because you're going to get tired. Um, looking at this plant, I would probably choose branches that are nice and straight. You don't want to do something that's kind of windy and growing kind of wonky because in the end your tree's going to look kind of weird and it's just not going to be ideal. You also want something that's about a sharpie thickness. So something about this thick here, something like this, or like this. Um, so looking at this particular bush, I would opt to probably do an air layer either on this guy, this one here, and this one here. It's growing nice and straight, actively growing, looking really healthy. It's about a sharpie fit, easy to get to, and yeah, looks like it'll be a good specimen. I have a couple of questions for Brittany. Um, so I know you're you're demonstrating for us today on the hibiscus brachynridgii, um, which is, yeah, I'm pretty familiar with the plant. We do have it at a bunch of our Julio Colau project sites. Um, and I'm definitely open to people coming down and trying their hand at air layers at those sites. But if somebody wanted to try in their yard or maybe like neighbor's yard, what are some more common types of species that might be more readily available for people to try on their own that would have maybe a high success rate? Um, I would say high success rate, like hibiscus is a great option. Um, people like to air layer fruit trees quite frequently. And I think a lot of people have at least one or two fruit trees in their neighborhood or know someone with one. Um, those types of, I think hibiscus would root the quickest. So if you're looking for a faster result, something like that would be a great option. But if you don't mind waiting a couple of months, people do air layers on ohia, um, pretty much any kind of woody species of tree that's easily accessible um, would be a good option. I would say just try a bunch of different different types of species and see what works and what doesn't. Yeah, that's one of my favorite uh, forms of propagating. <laughs> Just try it. Try it and see. Try a bunch of different ways. See which one works best. Um, and then I was wondering if you could also give us an example of any species that are particularly hard to air layer, or are there some species that you know of that maybe the that are just particularly hard to propagate, some more rare natives that um, maybe air layering is kind of the only way that campus, DOFA, OANRP have found success maybe only through air layering? So I would say species that produce like a lot of latex or wax are on a little bit more difficult to air layer just because it's hard for the rooting hormone to penetrate into the into the plant. Um, as far as species that do pretty well from air layering from like a conservation standpoint, I think for the most part, we would install air layers on trees that were older. So they didn't really have a lot of vegetative material to propagate from cuttings. Um, so it was kind of like, well, air layering is like not our last resort, but kind of. Um, I think for the most part, for efficiency in time and material, cuttings are probably your best bet. Um, and some species just don't take well from air layers, things like mint or like hibiscus does really well from cuttings, but it's just like things that are like a little bit more fleshier that can't really handle the weight of an air layer. Um, typically you wouldn't do. So I would say, yeah, for native species, we would do air layers on like Hesperomania, Oahu Ensense, um, Gardenia, 
Magii was another great option to air layer, took really well. Um, I think there would be some air layers on Flugia, but typically you would take cuttings of water shoots for those. Um, yeah, I would say Hespermania and Gardenia were kind of the more highly air layered species, at least that the army program manages for. And those are pretty rare species. <laughs> yeah. Um, found only in the Waianae mountain range? Um, Gardenia mania is both in the Waianae and the Ko'olaus. Um, Hespermania is um, only in the Waianae. Yeah. Oh, Jenny asked, what's a water shoot? Great question, I don't know either. Oh, so a water shoot for like larger, older species, a lot of times at the base of the tree during kind of the rainy season, um, you'll have like new growth coming out of it. And it's like new fleshy green growth. Um, and a lot of times like for Flugia, these trees are humongous. They're like over 50 feet tall. And for the most part, the base of the tree and like the upper limbs are kind of older and on their way out. So a lot of times when water and other nutrients are available for these trees, they'll send out new growth coming from the base. And that's what we would typically gather for cutting material in the field. Well, so Brittany, I noticed that um, when you were selecting your propagule, there was like a lot of green fleshy at the top and it almost looked like it was like woody or like wood at the bottom. Is there a difference between those two woods? And is there something that you're trying to really own in on when you're doing your air layer? Um, typically, I, I choose like a bit of the woodier material. Um, the general rule of thumb is that you want to air layer material that is like one to two years old, but it's a little bit different for here in Hawaii because we don't really have distinct growing seasons. So something that's one to two years old could be as thick as your arm um, for certain trees. And so if you try to air layer something that's green and fleshy, what can happen a lot of the times as you're cutting into it is that you can cut into the kind of not so hard wood center and it could actually snap that material. So if it's like a bit barkier and woodier, that center hard wood can handle the knife going in and it won't cut completely into it. So typically, because we can't gauge off of the one to two year size, it's good to go off the size of a Sharpie and something that's like a bit on the woodier side. Awesome, that looks like a, some good questions that we've got coming in. So I'm going to go ahead and show us the next video. Let me mute. All right, so we're ready to air layer. So I've selected this guy to air layer because he's growing nice and straight. He's easy to get to. There's no obstructions in front of it. And it's the thickness of a Sharpie. And it's growing pretty actively and healthy. It's nice and green up top. So the first thing you want to do is to cut an outer strip of the Cambrian layer. So looking at this particular plant, your air layer is going to be about this long. So I would opt to make an incision point right around here. So you're going to cut into this part and you're basically getting the knife into the woody part. And once we peel it, you'll kind of understand what I'm talking about. And then about an inch and a half to an inch downwards, we'll make another point. This is when it's nice to have a knife that has a flat edge on the back because it gives you a bit of leverage to apply pressure. So we got these two cuts, we're gonna connect them. You're gonna basically cut down there. And if you do it correctly, it should peel pretty nicely. And what we're doing is removing um, the phloem layer on the outside, and that's what brings sugars down to the bottom, which generates the root production. We're not cutting off all water supply. The xylem is on the inside. So this is still connected to the mother plant and it's getting at the water that it needs. And then another tip that I learned from Matt Garma is that you make a couple of extra incision points here. And this just allows for more surface area for the hormone to be absorbed into this particular plant. It just kind of, in theory, gives you better success and chance of developing roots. After that, we get our hormone. Usually I try to find a stick to kind of apply that hormone to what you did. So I got my 
stick here. And this is the nice thing about Clonex is that it's a really thick gel. So for hormones, a big kind of beginner mistake is feeling the need to apply hormones to the entire wound. That's just a waste of hormone. You're basically applying it to this upper part here, but that's really where the roots are gonna be producing. So try to get it in all the little cuts you made. Get a good application of it all around. All right, that looks good. Very cool. So I think I might have missed. So the the hormone is called Clonic. And is that something that's readily available for Joe Public? I don't know. <laughs> it, or is are those is that more of like a specialty order type of propagators tool? Um so you can find Clonelex pretty readily available like on Amazon, but I picked it up locally. There's a Ohana greenhouse and supply. It's like a hydroponic indoor growing kind of store. Um, and they typically have it. I think a lot of the stores that facilitate like growing indoor medical marijuana kind of things, because a lot of it's from cuttings, they'll typically have a pretty good selection of hormone. And I've always found it over there, um, but it's pretty easy to get. You don't need like a special permit or license or anything. Um, it's, it's called Clone X for the next year. Um, and then we do have a question coming in from Sana. Sana asks, does air layering work better in certain seasons? Yeah, so typically you would want to air layer when it's a bit cooler. So late fall, early spring, you don't want to air layer when that tree is flowering because the tree is diverting all this energy into flower and fruit production. So you would want to air layer kind of in the vegetative season. Um, but I would avoid air layering in the summer, if at all possible. Um, I haven't seen really great results doing that. Um, yeah. Okay, so we kind of are in a good period, a good time to, to start and to try right now as we're starting to cool off and head into the winter. Awesome. And then, so I noticed that you had just put the Clonex up around the top of the cut where you had made a few extra little cuts. Um, and you didn't apply it to the whole exposed area. Was that right? Yep, that's correct. Um, I was taught that it's just kind of a waste of hormone to apply to the whole wound because um, typically the roots will start to develop where you apply those upper cuts. So what's happening is the tree is converting sunlight and carbon dioxide through the leaves, producing sugar, and the sugar is what's being sent down to produce roots. Um, so because you're cutting off that connection to the lower part of the plant, you're really going to be applying hormone to encourage root development in that upper section. So if you're applying to the whole wound, I mean, you can, nothing terrible will really happen, but it's just kind of a waste of hormone and clonix isn't very cheap. So it's kind of good to be scarce and use like well, only what you need. Awesome. And then, um, I have a oh, go ahead, Jenny. Do you mind? So if you're gonna, um, if you're creating that wound on a plant, are you kind of killing the, uh, the branch underneath it? No, not really. Um, that's why it's really important to sanitize your tools. You are a wound in the plant, but what the plant will actually start to do over time is kind of callus over and start to heal those open wounds. Um, what can happen if you don't make that removal of the bark like wide enough is that the tree will actually try to heal itself and build a callus bridge to connect itself. So trees are pretty hardy. If it's a healthy tree, it can handle that. It's not going to kill off the lower branch. Um, but if it is a tree that's maybe a little diseased or it's not quite doing so well, there is potential that it could kill off. But for the most part, you won't really see any rotting or death um, if you do it sanitarily and correctly. Okay. And then do you have to remove leaves at all, Brittany? You know, like, will that help it grow roots or will it be not as beneficial? Um, I would leave leaves on. We typically don't remove leaves because the leaves are what's creating energy for that branch to produce roots. Uh, I think people think like, oh, I, I want to remove leaves to reduce the amount of water loss or anything like that. But because it's still connected to the mother tree, 
it's still getting that water flow. So it's still alive. So leave all those leaves on there until you're ready to collect it. Okay, yeah, let's jump oh. into the next video, Jenna. Sounds good. We've selected our material to air layer, we removed the cambrium layer, we applied the hormones, and now we're ready to actually put on the actual air layer. So what I like to do is have everything available and ready, just so you're not fumbling around when you're like really tight in there. So we got our two pieces of flagging, I sort of just drape it right by on a nearby branch of some sort. We've got our plastic, and now we get our moss. So you're kind of looking for a volume that's smaller than a tennis ball but larger than a golf ball. It's kind of like a lacrosse ball. And you're gonna squeeze out most of the water. You don't want it soaking wet, where it's just like dripping in your hand, but you also don't want it bone dry. You want moisture in there. So something kind of like that, you can really squeeze, a little water comes out, that's good. So about this much. Then we get our plastic, and at one end, you put your moss, and I kind of like to split it down the middle as to where you're gonna place the branch. All right, so we got our moss, and kind of where we made that little impression in the middle, we're gonna wrap around. And you wanna make sure that it's pretty centered in your moss ball. You don't want it too high or too low. And basically what I'm doing now is I'm kind of making sure it's completely enclosed, holding it tight. And with this hand, I'm gonna try and keep the shape and the form of the moss while kind of wrapping the plastic. So I'm holding with this hand the shape of the moss with this other hand I'm kind of pulling the plastic tight and it takes a little bit of finagling you're gonna go back and forth so now this hand is gonna be keeping the shape and this hand is pulling the tension on the plastic and you basically want to make sure that the plastic is wrapped tight tight enough that you're not allowing for excess moisture to come in and just cause rotting so now that it's kind of wrapped tightly it looks ugly now but we'll clean it up so I'll use one piece of flagging and I sort of just wrap it around, do a simple overhand knot just to kind of hold everything in place. Then what I like to do is kind of just tuck in the moss in the top part just to kind of clean it up. We got one end of the plastic and we're going to wrap it nice and tight. You can kind of fold this down a little bit you don't want the plastic so far up but you're going to wrap tight depending on what you're working with you kind of want to be cognizant of how tight you're manipulating the branch because it could potentially snap so wrap it nice and tight hold that we got our other piece of flagging I'm gonna tie a knot And then with the long end, it's hard to just wrap it up just to create a nice seal. Once again, to reduce the amount of ex excess water if it happens to rain or something from going into your air layer. Working in this tight little space, it's pretty difficult and it's a skill that you sort of develop the more you do it. It's, it's an unusual dexterity kind of thing so don't get discouraged. The more you do it the more second nature it'll be. Then we're going to start to tuck in the bottom. So same thing that we did at the top. Just kind of push that moss closer to the center just to clean it up. Then we get the end of that plastic and we're going to start wrapping it. a little knot and then we'll start to wrap to clean it up get a good tight seal Do a 
one double overhand. Yeah, looks pretty good. Alright, so we just finished installing the air layer and just to clean it up a couple things, just cut out the excess flagging here. And it's always important to write the date that you actually installed it. It gives you a good time frame as to when to check back and maybe you have to restrate it. So today is November 2nd. And you don't always have to put foil, but for this particular specimen, because it's in direct sun, there isn't really a lot of shade at all. Um, I'm just going to wrap it in foil. And this will just help to reflect heat away from the air layer. Give you better chances. You don't want it to be cooking and steaming inside where all that moss is. So for something like hibiscus that roots pretty easily, I would expect to see roots within a month, a month and a half. For other species that are more difficult, like say ohia, um, you could probably see roots between three to six months. It takes a bit of time. Um, so we will check back in about a month and I can show you how to actually harvest this hibiscus once it has rooted. That's awesome. Yeah, so I want to just quickly, um, before we jump into questions, I want to say that we are going to film with Brittany again to check back in on the air layers. So further along in our series in a few months, we will be going back in to look at that air layer with her and check in on the air layers. So if this is something that you guys are going to try to do at home, definitely rewatch the video as many times as you need and reach out to us at Huyoko Alao Poco. Um, to kind of help walk you through the process if needed. And then you've got something that you can check back in on um, after we do that next video in this series. Um, okay, so we did have a, oh, we got a couple questions. Okay, so where it says, what, uh, remind us what type of plastic that is. It looked like um, it was sticky. Um, so that plastic, it, I'm not exactly sure where they get it from at work, but it, it resembles something that's a bit, um, kind of like a thicker Ziploc bag. So you'd want something that's a bit thicker, but it kind of has like a little bit of stretch. So like something like Saran Wrap, I think if you were to try to really pull it and get it tight, it would just break. Um, at Army, we would use the plastic drop cloth. Um, that works really well. You just want something that has stretch and give that won't just like break and snap as you're trying to get a tight wrap around, but it's not really sticky at all. It's, it's just, like a thick plastic. So saran wrap might work. It sounds like it might be a little thin, but maybe even cutting open um, some plastic Ziploc bags could work. Awesome. And then Melissa asked, is there a good resource we can consult to know how long other plants take to root? Um, I think if you're gonna be doing native plants. There's the Growing Hawaii's Native Plant Book. That's a really great resource. It'll actually tell you for most native species what you, which method is the best for propagation. Um, I think for non-native species, I think Google would be a pretty good resource. Um, you can kind of look up things in related families and see if there's any information out there to kind of gauge how long an air layer might find specific information on. Um, but I think, yeah, the internet's a pretty great resource for that. I don't know of any specific website source, anything like that. I think one of the cool things about having that clear plastic layer on with the um, tin foil over it is you can always open the foil up to check on the plant and see if you can visually see roots. There's no harm in checking in once a month to see. And maybe you're trying on something more difficult, like you said, an ohia could take three to six months. So open it up, see if you can see some roots in there every every month or so. Um, and then Jenny asked, is there another type of moss that might work or any other type of medium or material that people could use? Um, I've seen people use peat moss. It's a little bit easier to find. You can find it at most hardware stores. You just basically want something that retains that moisture. Um, but yeah, if you can find sphagnum moss, that would be your best option. Um, I think you can find that at most like Floradec or any kind of craft stores where people kind of do it for floral arrangements and make it really pretty on top. 
Um, but if you can't find sphagnum, you can try peat moss. Um, I wouldn't use potting soil. I don't think people really use that often, but I mean, you could totally try if that's all you have. Um, just try to experiment, I suppose, if you can't find what works or what's available for you. Great, thank you. Okay, Jenna, do we have any other videos or is that brings us to the end? I think that brings us to the end. I do have another question for Britt though. Um, what happens if your sphagnum moss gets too wet? Um, if the moss gets too wet, what can happen is where you've made those cuts could lead to rot. So I think a good sign if your moss is too wet is if you installed your air layer and you kind of give like a medium amount of pressure on that moss and squeeze it. If you have water like actively gushing out, your moss is too wet. And your moss can also get wet if you don't wrap the plastic tight enough above and below. So if it's super raining and you've got like a little opening in that upper part of the plastic, rain, like water gets in and it just makes it really soggy. Um, yeah, you don't really want it too wet. It could lead to rot, especially because the wound is fresh as well. It hasn't had time to callus over and heal. Can you ever wrap it too tight? Like when you're sealing off the air layer? Um, you can, I think. For, the, for flagging, because it has a bit of stretch and give and it's a pretty wide band, you don't really run into the problem, I would say, of injuring the tree. You might run into the problem of using wire that it could potentially bruise the bark if you're wrapping it super tight. Um, that's why I would recommend using flagging tape or electrical tape, something that has a bit of stretch as you're pulling it, rather than wire that kind of like cinches it and pinches that bark. So you could potentially um, wrap it too tight, I think if you're using wire, but for flagging or electrical tape or anything like that, probably not. And what happens if I break it while I'm doing this? Um, you casually throw that branch to the side and hope no one sees it. And then you start <laughs> over. Um, I actually had, I installed a bunch of more air layers on that same hibiscus. And I had tried to do the cuts on like a bit of a greener material. And as I was cutting in, like I totally snapped off the branch. So it's a trial and error. You see what works for you. That's why you go for the woodier parts, but you just kind of figure out how delicate you have to be as you're cutting. And it takes time and practice and each individual species and tree is different. Um, so I would just say like, don't get discouraged and keep trying and be patient because it's, it's a skill that you kind of learn over time and you see success more over time. Awesome. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Brittany, for your time taking today and for the videos and also to Jenna for helping to put this whole series together. Um, we did have one more question online um, about our the Huyoko'olapoko plant foster parent program and how we ensure that pests aren't coming from people's houses out into our project sites. And that's a really awesome question. And of course, a big concern too with, um, you know, we've started to see little fire ants pop up here on Oahu and different things. So that's definitely something that's on HOK's radar and all of the plants get picked up from the houses that are brought back to my house and we don't have, HOK doesn't have a big nursery or anything like that. So I grow everything at my house on shelving pallet systems and it's pretty low tech, but um, I've got, you know, over a thousand plants in my house right now. So there's, you know, there's a level that everyone can be growing different plants at. But for us with the, with the pests, when we, I do pick up plants from potential or from the foster parents, they come back to my house for a period of time. So we've got a quarantine system set up. So they're at my house for a period before they do go out into the field. And then I'm able to watch for plants. I do test for little fire ants with the um, recommendations that OS has on their website. It's a little uh, peanut butter covered stick. So we're testing for little fire ants. And then if we've got, you know, um, black sooty mold or any pests, um, little spider mites or aphids or anything that are on the plant when I do pick them up, I can treat for those at my house. Um, and we have some good resources on the HOK website as well uh, for how to care for different common native plants and also how to deal with certain common 
pest species as well. So I hope that answers your question, Callie. And if you're interested in being a foster parent, just reach out to me. Um, I am going to, as we start to close up, I am going to go ahead and put one more poll up for everyone. And thank you guys all so much for your time joining us online today. Uh, Callie says, yes, she works at Havo and they're so strict about that kind of thing. Uh, that's the nice thing about working for a nonprofit. Um, <laughs> we have three staff members, so we get to make our own protocols, but I definitely take a lot of input from um, you know, partner agencies and other organizations that are more knowledgeable about that kind of stuff. So we do take those things into consideration. I would hate to be the reason we introduce something into the field here. Okay, I'm gonna launch that poll right now. And then if you're able to join us with the link that you were all given today to join us, that link is the same link for all of the other um, events in the series and our next series, our next class will be on Saturday, December 12th and that is propagation by cuttings. Jenna, did you want to add anything about that particular class? Um, not this time. We're still securing our guest propagator but vegetative cuttings is probably one of the most dominant ways to propagate plants so it should be a really good one. Feel free to bring lots of questions. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, so we've got, I guess I'll just run through um, some of those other series. So December 12th, we've got propagation by cuttings. January 9th, we're going to do propagation by graphing, which is kind of similar to air layering, but definitely goes another step beyond. And then in February, we'll be following up on the air layers. In March, um, I will be probably talking about out planting techniques and showing you guys how to choose sites for specific plants and how to actually put your plant in the ground. And then from then on, April and beyond, we will give our staff and our Kupu interns a chance to kind of highlight things that they've been learning um, and things that are becoming near and dear to their heart. And so we'll be doing some project tours and deep dives into some of our project sites. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for your time today. And hopefully you can all join us in the future at other events. Thanks, Jenny. <laughs> and feel free to reach out if you've got any questions at all. Email me and happy to answer your questions or try to connect you with someone that can. So, ahuiho. Thank you, everybody.